Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, more of the operating system end of the cloud. So we're going to talk about virtual machines, containers, uh, microservices, and unikernels. Um, so what are all of these things? Um, first, I'm going to uh, take you all the way back. So uh, in honor of Star Wars, the movie uh, coming out in December. Uh, so a really long time ago, in a galaxy that is actually quite near to here, we had this machine. Anyone know what that machine is? Uh, almost. If you look at the logo, the logo should give you a hint. It's kind of a Mac. It's before the Mac. This is how old I This is my first uh, computer that was all my own. So this is an Apple IIc. Uh, so you might be asking, why the heck? This is when uh, uh, floppy disks were actually floppy. And actually, I don't even know if any of you have ever used a floppy disk. You have? OK, good. <laughs> we're, we're falling fast, though, the people who have actually used floppy disks. Uh, so you might be asking, what the heck does this have to do with anything that we're, we're covering in this class? Uh, and before you go to Mark and Mark, the department chair, before you email him saying you want your money back from this course, there is a point to uh, talking about this system, as it turns out. Uh, so this was an instance of a single process system. So the Apple II, uh, the TRS-80, this color computer, that was my second computer. Um, these computers were single memory address spaces uh, using real memory. So uh, what you had was a single CPU that wasn't shared. It was a single tasking machine. Uh, you had an operating system disk that would load the operating system program into that memory space. And from there, the operating system that's loaded, you could uh, insert another disk that was your program disk. And what the operating system would do, it would read your program from the disk and replace itself. Because there's only one memory space, it had to replace itself with your program. And then you could run your program on that computer. But when you were done with that uh, program and you wanted to run a different program, you basically had to reboot the computer. And you rebooted the computer, you stuck your operating system disk into the computer, it booted, and you repeated every time you wanted to run a new program. Uh, so this is because there is a single set of resources that nobody shares. Everyone owns the whole thing. OK, so what about this computer? Does anyone know what that is? It's close. It's, it's, <laughs> you're going in the right direction. It wasn't the 2C. It's, not, it, it, it's just after the 2E. This is the original Macintosh. Uh, and it's not quite the original because you can actually see this is the only image I could pull of it that was kind of the original. That is actually the second iteration of the original Mac that's got those reset buttons on the side. Um, so this is the first Mac, uh, effectively. Um, so how do you think this differed architecturally from that Apple IIc, other than having a GUI, which is very nice, uh, having a mouse, which is very nice? What, what architectural, we're talking about processes and address spaces, what do you think the innovation of a Mac uh, was? Anyone, wild guess? Uh, not quite, but different programs. So the original Mac allowed multiple processes to share the same address space. So that is, that's the difference. And so you can see here, here's the desktop of the original Mac. Uh, you have the finder, uh, you have a calculator, and you have the, the operating system. So the finder is a program, the calculator is pro a program, and the operating system is also running all at the same time. They're sharing the exact same memory space. They are cooperating with each other uh, to provide you uh, a multitasking experience where you can go from one program to another. Uh, so you would ex explicitly switch between programs, and they do this by sharing that single shared real memory address space. And when you switch from one task to another, it would swap the CPU out. Okay. Uh, but there's an issue here. There is no isolation between any of the apps running on that computer between each other or between themselves and the operating system. 
it's all one memory space. Yes. Wait, so like in between switching apps, are you does only one program have access to that memory space at a time? So that like when you switch, is it like writing? Yeah, and hopefully they're just accessing their parts of the the memory space when you switch over. It's like when you load the program. So the program was loaded to be the the programs are written to be relocatable anywhere in real memory. And so you don't know what memory segment's available to you at runtime. So then when the Mac wants to run you, you would, you would get a portion of real memory to run in, and that would be yours. And then when you click back and forth between tasks, you would switch back to your part of memory. And hopefully, you can stay within your part of memory. <laughs> so if you are a programmer like me and write a whole bunch of memory errors in your program, and you dereference, like, so if you've taken Carla's class and you've got segmentation faults in your program, that's very unhappy when you are sharing the same memory space with an operating system and you have a null dereference or dereference that goes into operating system address space, you blow up. And so, uh, yeah, memory errors in one process completely blow up other, other parts of real memory. And you would get this. So if you actually have one of these systems uh, uh, anymore, this was a common occurrence. Like if you uh, installed an app and the app had a memory error in it and it overwrote a region of memory that it wasn't supposed to, you have to restart the whole thing. Like you can't flip bit bits in the operating system and hope to keep on running. So as soon as you flipped a bit in the operating system you weren't supposed to flip, you have to restart the operating system. And so this happened, this is so frustrating, because if you had a program you really loved, but it had some bugs in it, you were basically spending half of your time waiting for the thing to reboot every time. So this is an unhappy situation. Um, okay, so then we have these systems. I don't expect you to know what these things are. There's the IBM 370, uh, and this is back when most of the programmers were female, actually. This is how old this thing was. They actually figured out a particular way of designing a computing system that, were, that preceded its time because it's not until way later that this machine, this system comes out, Windows NT, uh, and it, I don't see, you can't see the serial number, uh, it's a 386, an Intel 386 processor. How do you think these systems might have differed from the Mac? Any ideas? CPU uh, switching between multi multi um, multitasking, but how would it be different than what the Mac is doing? Because the Mac is also multitasking. A different allotment on the CPU. What other allotment might they get? Protected memory. So these two things uh, gave you uh, virtual memory. So multi-process virtual memory, which is what we cover in 201. This is the abstraction that these systems have given you. Um, so the operating system, along with hardware, you need in order to make this run fast, you need some hardware support to do the to do this uh, uh, virtual memory uh, operation. Uh, so so the abstraction is that you have a uniform virtual memory space abstraction where every process believes that it has the entire, entire memory space to itself. Whereas in the original Mac, you were like, oh, I have this range that I have to stay within in order to run. Uh, in this case, you have all of it, okay? So each process believes it owns all of real memory, and the way, the way it's done, it's done as a trick, and it's done as a trick in the operating system because the operating system has this thing called the process ID. And every unique program that runs in this operating system has a unique process ID. And what the operating system does is if you have a memory, virtual memory address, like memory address zero, uh, and it goes to the operating system, the operating system is gonna take your process ID and then take your memory address and that combination is going to map into a real memory address in hardware. So that if a different process has memory location zero and sends it to the operating system, they'll go to a different spot. And your memory accesses will never cross. And you'll never get those things confused. And it's doing this, we call this a namespace. So your real address is a, is a function of a namespace ID, which is your process ID, and then the actual virtual memory address you're trying to access. Now keep this namespace thing in mind because we're talking about namespace spaces throughout 
this, this lecture. We're talking about a namespace. OK, so each process believes, so time slicing the CPU is one of these things. Uh, is, so the memory is one thing, and then time slicing the CPU based on that is the other thing that, that multiprocess virtual memory gives you, where you can switch from process to process and then just switch the memory mapping from one to another. So this gives you transparent time slicing of the underlying CPU with the scheduler. So this is what 333 is about. Um, and they all share this underlying hardware through the operating system. And uh, we, when, I, when I teach 201, I say, this is a virtual computer abstraction. Now that you're in the advanced class, I'll put the ish there, uh, because it's kind of a virtual computer, but not really. It's, it, there is some sharing going on, but it's giving you some illusion of kind of a virtual computer. Um, so these are the systems we've talked about, and I'm going to put them in a circle. We have, uh, I talked initially about a single process machine that has real CPU, RAM, and OS that's not shared. And then we evolved to this thing, which is a real CPU, RAM, and OS, but then you're doing this sharing, cooperative sharing between applications and the operating system, which was the Mac. And then in the evolution, so this is a de-evolution, actually, back to the Mac from the, uh, from the 370, but this was way cheaper, so I give Apple a break. Uh, but then we have this thing, uh, which is true multi-process virtual memory, and you have the virtual CPU and a virtual memory abstraction, um, but the, and, and then the OS is still real. There's only one version of the operating system running uh, on that thing. Okay, so we will refer back to this uh, later on. Um, so I said this is a virtual computer-ish abstraction. What resources are not virtualized in an operating system? So think about your operating system classes. Think about all the different things the operating system does. Uh, you have a virtual memory abstraction, and you have virtual time slices for the CPU. What are other, other things that operating systems implement that aren't virtualized? Anyone? Uh, the virtual, okay, yeah, virtualized hardware. You're doing the, they're, you're both sharing the real hardware. So uh, when you do an if config between two programs, you should get the same thing. The same Ethernet card uh, shows up. Uh, what else? How about the file system? You share the file system, right? There's one view of the file system, and every single process on that system shares that. That's not virtualized. Uh, uh, either. Um, so processes are still sharing some of the operating system resources. So the file system, the networking ports. I can't have two processes open up a web server on port 80, right? That port space is not virtualized amongst processes. So it's not really a virtual computer. It's, you know, you, you have to share the first one who grabs port 80 gets it. And then, and then you can ex expose the fact that some other process there is consuming uh, a computer resource. So it's not completely hidden from you. Uh, the users and the groups on that operating system are all shared. So for example, usernames, group names, those are, that namespace is all shared amongst the users and the processes on that system. Uh, so the only thing that's got a namespace in the operating system pretty much is memory. <laughs> Right, because the memory has this namespace that takes a, takes into account the PID uh, and your virtual memory address. Um, so the problem with this is that if you have a security break in one of your applications running, you can basically break into everything else potentially on that system. So this is what motivates virtual machines. So with virtual machines, you try and get rid of this shared notion of hardware. So virtual machines try to give you uh, uh, sort of a namespace for the hardware resources. And then using that namespace, you can basically own a slice of hardware, the full hardware. Um, and so what this does, it, the a virtual machine, so what you have is some layer here that provides you a namespace to all of the hardware. And then based on which machine you're accessing it from, you'll get a different kind of state from one uh, set of hardware to another, okay? So I think the easiest thing to, to think about is having some kind of namespace. So this is operating system one and operating system two. Down in the virtualization layer, 
uh, this thing knows about the namespace and then can mediate the hardware access. Okay? Uh, so the virtualization is done in what's known as a hypervisor layer. So it's a level of indirection between your running operating system and the actual hardware. Um, before what you had is that you had the operating system running directly on native hardware. The virtualization layer uh, fakes it out for, for that machine. So this is powerful because it's decoupling the operating system from the hardware that it runs on. And this is what allows you to take a virtual machine and run it on different machines. You can take that, 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 that uh, virtual machine archive and move it from machine to machine potentially. Okay, uh, one of the good things about this is that it enforces isolation and resource allocation between the two VMs. I could run two virtual machines on my computer and if one of the virtual machines has got a security problem, a security break, they can't jump through the virtualization layer to affect the other one. And that is different from what I had earlier, right? Because they were sharing the file system and the group space. Here, this thing could be completely compromised and then this thing can still run securely, is the idea, okay? Um, so in this case, the virtual machine sees its own CPU, its own memory, its own network components. Uh, it runs its own operating system uh, and uh, is isolated except when it's not, which is where this is a hardware bug that came out last year. But for the most part, you can see that this is, you can, you can think about this as being completely isolated. Um, so this really became popular when Intel and AMD started supporting virtualization in hardware in around 2005. So this was part of what helped the cloud uh, proliferate, is hardware support for doing this kind of stuff. Okay. So virtual machines are also an ancient idea, and this also uh, came in the 60s. So uh, the idea was in, in this uh, system called CP40, uh, and then IBM, the System 370, which we talked about earlier, it had virtual memory, and it also had virtual machine uh, support in the 1970s. Uh, the thing is, is x86, didn't get it until 1999. So it took about 20 some 30 years for uh, virtualization to come to x86. And at this point, this was VMware who, who brought uh, hypervisors to, uh, to the Windows uh, platform. Um, so why would you virtualize? So the idea back then was that I have a mail server, I have a database server, I have a web server. They're all running different configurations, different versions of the operating system, different software stacks. Uh, and so they would each get their own physical machine. But if your database server is idle, then that hardware is doing nothing where it could be serving web server uh, traffic instead. And so the idea of virtual machines is why don't I cr make all three of these virtual machines running on the same hardware? And then when the database server is idle, the web server can use all of the resources of the, of the physical machine and vice versa. Um, so that's the idea. You can get this domain isolation, but then you can get better resource usage of the underlying uh, physical machine. Um, okay. Uh, so there are multiple types of hypervisors. The one that you are probably running on your laptop is, is it called a type two hypervisor. And the architecture of a type two hypervisor is that you have a host operating system and the hypervisor runs from the host operating system giving you this layer of indirection uh, through the virtualization layer to the hardware. And then if you had multiple VMs, they would each talk through this virtualization to the, to the host operating system, all right? So the hypervisor is basically running um, these guest VMs. So this is called a guest VM, and then this is the host machine uh, on the bottom. So that's the terminology when we talk about virtual machines. Um, and then what happens is anytime this thing has an operating system call, it gets trapped into the virtualization layer and then translated to the, uh, the host operating system. Okay, so these are some examples of type two hypervisors. Uh, where the hypervisor is running on a host operating system, and you're probably, you're using VirtualBox in this class, but there's multiple other ones. Uh, there's also the type one, this bare metal hypervisor, and it removes the underlying host operating system. And this is what you'll get in the cloud. Uh, so in this case, the hypervisor is running natively in hardware, 
uh, or firmware, and it's basically running a whole bunch of operating systems uh, uh, on, this, on this virtualized layer. Okay? Um, so this is commonly used in data centers. So uh, Zen, KVM, uh, Microsoft Hyper-V, VMware e ESXi, these are all instances. So G uh, Google uses KVM, Zen is used by AWS, Hyper-V is uh, Azure. They're all basically supplying the same functionality on their hardware to run virtual machines uh, on, on those nodes. Okay? So they, they sometimes call these bare metal uh, hypervisors. Uh, as the terminology goes. Okay, so now we're, this is what we have. We have uh, the virtual machines, and virtual machines virtualize the hardware, uh, and you still have a real operating system running those individual uh, operating systems. Okay, other questions about virtual machines and what they're doing? Okay, so there are some issues with virtual machines, uh, and you're probably living these issues. The first is startup time. When you bring up your virtual machine, you have to wait for an entire operating system boot process in order for you to use that thing. Um, uh, the size of it. So you've got the entire operating system and all of its libraries in your virtual machine. And when you have another virtual machine, and it's actually running the same operating system with maybe slightly different libraries, you have to have a complete copy of that operating system again on your virtual machine. Um, and so, uh, it also requires a large amount of resources. Each of the virtual machines on there has to have, the kernel on each of those virtual machines has to have enough memory to run. So you're talking about, so if, 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 the, if each operating system needs a gig of memory to run uh, properly, you know, for every virtual machine you run on your system, you need an extra gig of memory, real memory. Uh, and a lot of that memory is storing the exact same thing across the virtual machines, right? If I have five Ubuntu VMs, trying to run on this laptop, they're all taking a gig to store pretty much the exact same stuff. Uh, so that's a problem. Um, you really want some isolation between virtual machines without having to do a full replication of the software stack, right? Like, why can't I share parts of the operating system kernel that are used across multiple virtual machines? If I know I have five Ubuntu 1804 VMs running on my laptop, like, can't they just share some of that code? Like, do I, why do I have to install uh, a, a copy for each one? Uh, the other issue is that it's not quite portable. Uh, and you'll find when you try and take a virtual machine and you take it from Google Cloud over to AWS, it is not trivial. Uh, so this is a problem. Um, so this motivates uh, containers. So what are containers? Uh, the idea of containers is simple. Why don't we virtualize the operating system? So wrap your head around that. That is not straightforward. Well, maybe it's straightforward to some of you, but that might not be straightforward. How do I have a virtual operating system? Um, so, so far, we have the traditional operating systems virtualizing CPU and memory, and they leave the file system and the network alone. Those things are shared amongst all the processes in that, on that system. So the idea of containers, oh, and then you have virtual machines that virtualize the hardware. So they're virtualizing just the hardware resources and they're putting a namespace uh, on top of that. Uh, but then they do this, they, they force a copy of all of this. So the idea of containers is to virtualize the operating system where you're basically uh, putting a namespace in the operating system itself. And then the operating system is giving you different virtual versions based on a container name. Okay, so you're, con yes? Uh, about a decade. It's been around for a decade. Uh, there is a history associated with containers, which I probably will just briefly touch upon, but yeah, it's been in the works uh, for a while. Um, so the idea of containers is that you don't replicate the operating system, but within all of the operating system code, you implement a namespace so that you can have different containers that virtualize the operating system, and those multiple containers can share one underlying operating system that understands namespaces and can identify one container access from another and then provide some isolation inside of the kernel. 
So that is what a container at the highest level is, a, is attempting to do. So how does it do this? Uh, so basically, the, the abstraction is now every container sees that it owns the entire operating system. So in, when we say the entire operating system, we mean more than just the memory. We mean the file system, and we mean the network ports. We, we, ideally, the containers will virtual, virtualize every piece of the operating system that the operating system supports. So that's the idea. OK. So how? So it's done with this thing called the namespace. Uh, and it's just like virtual memory, having a namespace that uses the process ID. Uh, for a virtual operating system, the operating system is virtualized using the container name. When you run a container, it's an instance of a virtual OS. And it's got a name. And you'll be working with the name all throughout your labs. And within the real kernel underneath that's supporting it, uh, that name is going to be used to connect you up to your state so that you have the illusion of having your own operating system that's not shared with other people. Uh, the only issue is that uh, only compatible containers can run on top of a, a particular host, right? If I have a Linux enabled, con uh, a container enabled Linux underneath, then it can only run Linux containers. Is the, uh, uh, so it's not like uh, virtual machines. Because virtual machines are virtualizing the hardware, I could run side by side a Windows box with a Linux box on the same machine because it's only multiplexing x86, as long as both things are running on x86. Uh, with a container, uh, I can only run Linux containers on a Linux-enabled uh, uh, operating system. Okay. And then the container OS is going to enforce the isolation and, doing, and, and the resource allocation between the two uh, instances. Okay. What are questions about that? That's just the fundamental abstraction that, that containers are, are attempting to provide. Not yet, but you see Windows is, is, is giving Linux a big hug, so they've got uh, a lot of runtime support for Linux. So now you might be able to. In fact, has anyone tried it? Because OK, so I might need to update that. When they actually do get the be able to run a, a Linux container on a Windows 10, then I'll change my slides. But the, they're having to do have some heavy lifting in their operating system, because they are basically forced to implement all 350 Linux system calls uh, natively in their operating system in order to, to fake out a Linux container to actually believe that it's got that. So, and, they, and they have to implement it in the semantics that Linux supports. So they are doing that. I know they're doing that, but I don't know how close they are to actually getting a container to run. Uh, yeah, the, so the Linux, the, the API is quite stable now. So yeah, you're not yeah you're not really adding a bunch of stuff to what Linux provides you, uh, but yeah that's the yeah that's the idea. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Maybe I don't I haven't tried it. I did run WSL on Windows, and it you can apt install, and you can do. <laughs> You can do a lot with the Windows subsystem for Linux. I just haven't tried running a Linux container on, uh, on WSL. Um, maybe, probably. I don't know. Has it, anyone? Yeah, like there's one for Visual Studio. I think they have a similar container that it loads up. So you can have like a separate Linux code running. Oh, OK. On your Windows machine. All so right. You run the container in the background, and then refresh your code as like an internal SSH. Yeah. OK. OK, is that container running on the same system, or is it running? Because a lot of these things are like, oh, I'm going to run a container remotely, and then you're just going to interact it, seamlessly interact with it. So even though it looks like it's local, hey, it's running in VS Code, it might actually be uh, running hosted somewhere else. Yeah? You, you, you can, I think, yeah. You can run uh, different versions of Ubuntu on the same uh, host operating system, yeah. That is, that is something you can do. Um, OK, so here is a picture that shows the difference. So here's what you have for the virtual machine. You have your app, you have your libraries, and you have an entire copy of the guest operating system 
And you have a hypervisor layer that, so this is for our type two uh, thing, and you have a hypervisor layer that talks to the actual operating system. And you're replicating this layer right here, the guest OS. And so with containers, you get something that looks like this. Uh, you have a container enabled host operating system. And this operating system talks to Docker. So Docker is this container management, this container runtime management uh, tool. And this thing is saying, oh, I'm going to manage the namespaces between all of my different containers. And then I'm going to use the, this management to leverage the namespace in the operating system so that all these calls from the individual containers will go to the, will be labeled appropriately in the container enabled OS so that you can get the abstraction that your, your operating system is your own. Okay. So that's the, uh, that's the high level picture of what a container is doing. Yeah. Yes, you can run earlier versions uh, as long as, yeah, the compatibility has been for, for calls. And usually that, that's pretty seamless. Uh, and in my, in my uh, experience with them, at least, I haven't had any issues running the earlier versions on the later ones. Yeah. There are security issues with containers, actually. I just went through a half-day workshop on container security. There's many ways, and this is why Cat won't let you run Docker on any of those machines. Uh, well, first of all, the, this Docker runtime runs as root, obviously. You actually need to run a container. You're accessing uh, the full system. Uh, but you can misconfigure a container to break into the host operating system. So <laughs> we don't have a container security course here, uh, maybe. If, if this is something that uh, is by default insecure, then yeah, we're going to have to teach people how to securely run containers. But typically, uh, this might be happening in the back end. So whether or not you're going to manually run containers when you graduate and get out to the real world is it, you may not ever have to actually run it manually. You might have a system deploy containers underneath, and it's completely hidden. So this is when you go serverless. On the back end is a bunch of containers running your stuff that you never have to see, right? That's the idea of serverless. But this is what is the underneath that's actually being run to give you that illusion. So hopefully you're not you're not deploying these things uh, too much. Yeah. Yeah, I'll get there. Yeah, in fact, the, the, you got me a couple slides early, but yeah, I'll talk about microservices uh, in a bit. Um, okay, so the implementation, uh, this happened in the uh, mid-2000s, uh, and it was sort of mainlined in 2008, and it basically, it implements these control groups, and these, this is your namespace. You know, which con control group is this operating system call coming from? Is it container number one, container number two? Each one gets a C group, and then based on the C group, the kernel, the container-enabled OS, is going to sit there and manage the resources across those C groups. So things like CPU allocation would be done based on a C group. So when you create a, uh, a virtual machine on Compute Engine and it's got multiple, uh, well, that's, that's actually done as a VM. But when you, can, when you say, hey, I want a certain allocation of CPU resources for a container, then it's basically mapping that into some resource consumption uh, allocation for a C group is effectively it. OK. Um, so yeah, it, it, that's the implementation of it. Uh, and so this namespace isolation is being done through these C groups to allow a complete, uh, more or less complete isolation of the application's view of the operating uh, system environment. So when you enter into a container, you could have multiple containers running on your system. Uh, when you enter into a particular one and you do a process list, a PS, you'll get a completely different process tree than the other process, uh, container, proce uh, container running. So when they do a PS, you both have process ID 1, right? And the reason why you have both process ID 1, these things map to real processes in the host operating system. When you do a PS in the host operating system, the host operating system's got a, the complete tree of processes in the container. And so you'll see that one process 1 on one container has actually got a, a PID of 13,000. And the other process one in the other container has 13,001. So this is where the namespace, I have the container name, and I have a, a resource like a process ID. 
And then that maps to the actual process ID on the host, which might be completely different. So that's, that's, that's what's going on. And this is done throughout. This is done through the networking system. So which IP address do I come up on? So one container has one IP address, one container has another. I need to get packets to and from the containers appropriately. It's going to use a namespace. It's going to use the C group to figure out, oh, I have a packet for this IP address. It goes to this container, uh, and I, it can do that mapping for you. Uh, so your user IDs are all different. Uh, so like Etsy password would be different on the different containers because you have namespaced the file system. Everyone's got a different file system as part of the container, and that maps into the actual real file system underneath somewhere uh, in, in the Docker, var run Docker, or somewhere, somewhere in, in the real operating system is, is where all this stuff is kept. Uh, so the biggest thing here, the take home point here, is that you're sharing the operating system code. I don't have to have multiple versions of that operating system. It's just demultiplex based on the container name. Okay, so is that straight with people? Okay, so some of the benefits, and I, we already talked a little bit about this, you get pr uh, similar isolation between containers, between the virtual operating systems, you get similar protection, but you get a lot less overhead versus virtual machines. You're not replicating as much. Uh, they're fast starting. So you can start a container very quickly because you're not booting an operating system, right? So it's almost like starting up a program. It's more like uh, running a binary than it is booting an operating system. And so you'll see run to, like uh, startup times uh, for containers, they're, they're measuring these things in single digit seconds. In fact, when you, when you go to AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud, they're all measuring their startup times, their cold start times of containers, and it better be under basically five seconds, otherwise you're slow, you're considered slow, because these things have to come up and down uh, very quickly. Uh, the memory footprint is much smaller than a virtual machine, because there is only one operating system, and only that operating system allocates the one gig of memory that it needs, not every individual operating system in the, uh, in the VM case. Uh, it's portable, so you have got the abstraction layer at the operating system level, so I can run a, the same container in my office on Google Cloud, on AWS, and then on Azure. So Azure is actually the, they're actually, that cloud service is one of the largest Linux operating system runners, even though it's, it's Microsoft. Um, so it runs on any compatible underlying operating system. And so this is what we were talking about earlier. Windows might be a compatible Linux operating system soon, if not already. Um, and if, if someone comes across an article that says, yes, it's already uh, compatible with Linux, then I can change that. Uh, okay, uh, it's repeatable. So it runs the same regardless of where you run, which we talked about. Um, and it solves this problem, works on my machine problem. So when you send that, when you send this, this doesn't work on my machine, uh, then it shouldn't work on, on mine either, like your machine. Like we should have the exact same error on a container if an error happens uh, is the idea. Okay, so this is taking off in industry. So one of the biggest reasons why people want to do this is that it can unify the dev environment with the production environment. One of the hardest handoffs was for a developer to have all of this stuff running on their system and to somehow get that same thing running in the data center. Uh, and that is a huge issue. So what libraries did the developer install? Like what compiler version? What, uh, ver what version of the, uh, of the patches did that person install? All of that stuff has to be exactly right, otherwise the thing won't work potentially. So with a container, what you can do is you can say, you know what, I'm going to ship you a container image. And then uh, all you have to do is I'm going to build this container image. So this is what your homework is going to be. You're going to build a Docker container. And then you're going to ship it by uploading it to a container repository. And then the idea is that the production folks, this is your, your, your operations team, all they need to do is pull that image and then run it. And they have the exact same software stack that you have that you had thing, the thing running. So if everyone is using Docker containers as the sort of the portability layer, then you can streamline. So if you're doing these, these tight iterations, uh, you, can, you can basically, in your workflow, get this done very quickly. And you don't have, you don't have configuration issues as you would before. Okay. 
you could do basically like to, to onboard new developers. It's like, hey, here's our dev environment. Just go to this Docker run the, the company's dev environment. It's that easy to get someone's, all the versions of their packages and all the different compilers that they're using. You can just do it by uh, uploading a Docker image and then running it. Um, this is a way of, of shipping software. And so uh, if, if any of you are familiar with Ubuntu Snaps, the idea of Ubuntu Snaps is to package all the dependencies into one package and then ship that package for that particular binary. The, the idea of a Docker container is similar. I can ship all the libraries and the, and the binaries that my program needs into one container layer, or one container image, and then ship that. Uh, so I don't need to have individual people creating their own virtual environment, doing pip installs, doing this, that, or the other. All of that stuff can be wrapped around a single container and then uh, issued uh, all as one. Um, in terms of security, compared to a traditional operating system that has this monolithic, there's this term called a LAMP stack. This is Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. This was a way of running a monolithic web property uh, back in the 90s and the early 2000s. Uh, the problem with putting all of these services on one stack is that when you own the front end, like PHP, which is highly ownable, you end up owning the back end, which is like the MySQL that the PHP is connecting to. And so one of the biggest things from a security standpoint is that you can have this separation, this isolation of different parts of your application. And this is done with containers doing something what's known as a microservice architecture, um, which is where a lot of companies are, are moving to in terms of breaking down their, uh, their software that they're running. So here's a picture of what microservices are trying to do. Uh, the other term that you'll find is a service-oriented architecture. Uh, and the idea here is that here you have your monolithic LAMP stack. They, you know, you, maybe that's your front end. This is your database. Uh, this is maybe your application code. And so you would package, typically you would monolithically package all of that into a single virtual machine image perhaps, and then ship that. <laughs> Uh, and the problem is, is that uh, this is the, the granularity of scaling up that app is on the, the, the I guess the, the granularity is the whole app in its entirety going from, from one server to another. And when you do this replication, you're replicating all of these things, even if, for example, if the blue is the, the web server and that's not actually a bottleneck, you're going to replicate that code even though it doesn't need to be replicated, even though that that's like the, 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 the thing that's least loaded, you're, because they're all tied together tightly, uh, you have to replicate the whole thing. So this is the traditional approach. What they're talking about with microservices is to take your app, and you have these colored pieces as well, uh, but then you containerize each part of your app. So for app number one, you break these things up into each individual container, and then what you can do is you can map containers and replicate containers as needed in your server backend. So if the blue thing only needs two copies, you can see that there's only two here, but if the orange thing needs three copies because it's getting hit all the time, you can, have, you can instantiate those. And then you have your servers, and then your servers are running uh, all sorts of containers from both app one, and moreover, you can have your second app, so you have another developer team uh, that's running an app, and if one app isn't using the resources and the other app needs them, then you can multiplex the other app right on top of the same infrastructure that you're using to run the app number one. So this is the kind of resource flexibility that containers give you that a monolithic architecture can't. Okay? So the, the idea that uh, comes, so um, there's this Home Depot podcast that I can point you to. Uh, they have the, the idea, they, have, they had this issue where they had the shopping cart, they had a store locator service, they had a suggestion service, and it used to be monolithic, but then they're basically shipping that whole stack from server to server and then scaling it up that way. As soon as they started splitting these things up into microservices, they were much more agile. Then the shopping cart people could just go and run the shopping cart stuff and then pay for only the resources that they consumed. Like it would, only, it would just scale up the shopping cart uh, containers uh, as the demand needed, and then it would scale down the shopping cart containers as that uh, uh, usage subsided. Whereas if you're doing this as a VM, you're basically replicating it based on the thing that needs it the most. 
Uh, so that's, that's the idea. All right. Uh, so you know containers are popular when it makes it onto XKCD. Uh, I'm going to skip that, but go back into the slides and read this comic. It's, it's kind of amusing. Um, the aside is that Google is all in on containers. Um, and the reason, and so this, they're actually, they did an estimate, they're running billions of containers every week. When you actually access your mail in Google Mail, it actually is on the back end, it's popping up a container just for your mailbox, just for you. And that's giving you some isolation on the back end for your mailbox. Uh, so, and they need to do that, like, they need to be able to run these things quickly if they're going to uh, do that on, on demand, on every session. Um, and so this allows Google to really pack a whole bunch more services onto a single machine than they could ever do before, rather than doing virtual machines per uh, instance. Um, and so by running, in fact, they, uh, I, two years ago, they interviewed uh, one of the Google engineers, and he's like, the only place where we're running VMs now is on Compute Engine. That's the only place that they, that they do, do this VM. Um, and it's now a, a corporate strategy to catch up to AWS. So if you know anything about AWS, AWS sort of dominated cloud computing because they basically allowed the, they basically dominated it by supplying EC2, which is a service for virtual machines. And so everyone is locked into EC2 virtual machines. There's a lot of companies with VM uh, deployments on EC2 that are no longer mobile, like they're stuck. That is a heavy lift to get them out of it. Uh, and so they want, so Google's strategy was to move everybody to portable containers. If they can get everybody into uh, a portability layer, then what happens is that the best runner wins. And so Google, uh, AWS, and, and uh, Azure uh, can all run containers now. And so where they can compete is that they can uh, it's basically you're going to compete on operations management and the network, and this is where Google felt like they could have an advantage because they've been running this thing for a pretty long time with their web properties. Uh, so that's the idea, and so they, you can see with their open source comp contributions, they are trying to make everything portable, and most companies want this, right? Because most companies don't want to get locked into the cloud. And this is why I think you'll see all of the software industry is also going to portable containers where they can run that container on any of the providers. So that if uh, AWS, Google, or uh, Microsoft raise their prices on their machines, they can easily shift workload off of those machines and into other cloud providers. So this is what multi-cloud is all about. So when uh, when companies are talking about multi-cloud and using tools to make sure that they can uh, nimbly move from one cloud provider to another, they're probably talking about doing this via containers uh, as the way. And this is why all of our, our, all of our exercises in this particular uh, class are focusing on containers. Okay. Uh, and so you can see all of this, uh, all of the contributions from Google on the LXC stuff in 2008. And then they actually, uh, you, they had their own uh, in-house container solution called Let Me Contain That For You, L-M-C-T-F-Y. And they merged all of this stuff into Docker because they, they actually wanted a critical mass of open source developers. Uh, and so Google knows it can't develop all of this software on its own. So their strategy for this stuff is to open source it as quickly as possible and get a bunch of free labor. Well, it's not, I mean, everyone is doing it for their own interests. But like by having this, this actually evens the playing field for, for most people. Okay, so we are almost done with our picture. We have containers over here, which is a virtual operating system uh, as part of this picture. Uh, so we have some issues with containers. Uh, virtual machines are about 10 gigs uh, of space. Uh, containers are about 500 megabytes. Like, uh, unoptimized containers, I should say. Um, but if you are going and adopting a microservice architecture, that container is not doing much, right? <laughs> like if, if it's just the shopping cart app, like it's a very tiny thing. Why does it need 500 megabytes? Well, it might need 500 megabytes if the base operating system layer that the container runs is something like this, Ubuntu 18.04. Ubuntu 18.04 has a base size that is huge. Uh, so then the question is, is, do I need everything in Ubuntu 18.04 in my container? 
Um, so can I use a smaller runtime? Uh, and it turns out this is what your homework will be about. Uh, you, uh, the, the idea of shrinking containers is to remove all parts of the operating system code that you don't need out of the container. Uh, and then this small footprint, so what you do is you go through your container and find out all the dead code that you don't need, and you get rid of it. Um, you can also start with a base layer that has just the essentials. So you'll see this mini Ubuntu distribution, an Alpine Linux uh, distribution, uh, there's BusyBox. These are all container base layers that have basically very little in them. And then you construct on top of it the libraries that you actually need to run your app. And this allows you to get away from, from the bloating uh, in container images. Uh, on Windows, you have this thing called Nano, which is uh, Windows Nano images that are, that are extremely small. Uh, but still, when you do this, when you get rid of all the libraries that you don't need and, and your programs, you still have this issue. So this is a picture or a graph of the number of system calls in the Linux operating system. And so how many of these programs, of these microservices, actually need all 375 system calls in the Linux operating system? Uh, you can run strace on your Python thing and figure out how many operating system calls it needs. But it's not going to be 375, I can guarantee you that. And if Python is the only thing you're running, or Python, if your Flask application is the only thing you're running on that uh, container, then why do I need the full Ubuntu underneath, is the uh, idea. Um, and so there are many ways of reducing container bloat. Uh, so some examples of, of things that you can do, or remove. Uh, one example is, do you need the USB subsystem or a floppy drive uh, support in your app. Like if you're running a Python Flask app, like you don't care about the USB subsystem. You have it there, uh, but you're not going to use it. Uh, do you need bin ls? Like I don't need bin ls. It's running a web app, right? Like you, there should be no lsing going on on my web app. I mean that like, that's a, for the WebSec class. That's 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 money for a hacker if you can run bin ls on someone's web app. Um, so it's actually good if you remove that. Uh, do you need the file system? So some web apps don't need the file system. Like if you're going serverless, why would you write into the file system? There is no file system that you can rely upon when you're serverless. Uh, so you might not need the file system drivers. I don't need X3 or uh, any of those uh, file systems. Do you need the graphics subsystem? No, a Python Flask doesn't need a, uh, 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 it does not play in video games, so it doesn't need the graphics cards or any of those drivers. Uh, so this motivates, uh, unikernels. So what are you, you probably have never heard of unikernels unless you work for Calwa. Um, so unikernels, the idea of unikernels is uh, these are single process programs compiled to run directly on the hardware rather than within a full featured operating system. Um, it's, a, it's a virtual machine that's basically a single application and just the libraries that it needs. And it's running in a single address space. So the, the library and the operating system share a single address space. And the only thing that this thing can, this unikernel can do is run that one app. And then what, the, uh, what you can do is only the parts of the operating system that this application needs are included in that memory space. Okay, so you can get rid of a whole bunch of stuff. So in particular, uh, uh, we'll talk about that uh, in a second. Um, so th one of the things about doing a unit kernel is that you can't run anything other than your app. You basically look at your app, you look at the operating system code that it needs, and you strip out everything else. And then only the code that actually is required is, is included. And then the benefit of this is that now everything can run in privileged mode, right? Because it is, you're, you're the only thing running, so you don't need to do the context switching. You don't need a scheduler. You don't need user land code. You don't need virtual memory. You own everything uh, on, that, on that system. Um, and this will also allows you to run a whole bunch of unikernels multiplex on a single piece of hardware. Right? So with a container, you're stuck with that operating system layer. Like you have to run a compatible operating system layer. If you're going back to a virtual machine abstraction, then you can run anything that's compatible with the hardware again, um, is the idea of a unikernel. 
Okay, so here's a picture of it, because the picture is way better than the explanation. Um, so you have your app, this is star, and it requires, all, uh, and this is the stack that your app sits upon. So maybe some libraries, some programs, programs, libraries, maybe some operating system pieces uh, at the bottom. And then this app is only going to use this part of each one of these things. So the idea of a unikernel is to get rid of everything else that's not in these rectangles, uh, and then to ship this app with all the pieces that it needs uh, in a single uh, memory address space. Okay. Uh, so this gives you much, even compared to containers, this gives you lower operating cost, can potentially give you lower operating costs, even compared to a container. Um, and a much smaller attack surface because you're not running a full-fledged operating system on this virtual machine effectively. Okay. So this is a comparison of all three things that we just talked about. We have the virtual machine on the left, application runtime operating system on top of a hypervisor. We have the container in the middle, application and runtime libraries running on a container-enabled operating system. And then finally, we have just the unikernel app running in a single uh, machine process address space running on a hypervisor on the right. Okay? Um, there are some papers about this approach uh, in the extra slides that you can take a look at if you're really interested in this thing. Um, and the reason I bring this up, uh, so Galois is a company uh, just down the road here, uh, and they have this uh, system called CyberChaff. So the idea of CyberChaff is to pop up a bunch of computers that appear to be vulnerable. Like a whole bunch of servers that appear to an adversary to have something running on them when they don't. So you can think of this as, so the Potemkin villages were these villages in Russia where they propped up something that looked like a village to scare the invaders into thinking there were a bunch of people there. So this is the idea. If you are an attacker and you come across this uh, enormous network of potential devices and you have to enumerate those things, maybe that will deter you from trying to attack that, uh, uh, that system. And so that's what this product is trying to do. Uh, and every CyberChaff node is in its own virtual machine. So you want to run thousands of these things on a single piece of hardware and then make it appear that you have thousands of, of, of separate servers uh, running on a particular network when you only actually need one. Uh, you can't get that. You can't get to this level of scaling with containers. Containers will give you maybe a dozen or so before it, before your resources run out. They're talking about thousands of these things on a single machine, and that's what cyber. This is what uh, CyberChat is. Uh, let me see, and it's all done in Haskell. Uh, and I think I'm going to just show you the picture of what it looks like. Uh, I don't have a picture actually. Um, okay, well, I'm just going to skip that. Uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, uh, Docker acquired this unikernel systems uh, as a way of adding to their services. So this is just another option for someone to run their code. And if you're running microservice, simple microservices as uh, a unikernel, you might actually get cost savings. That's the idea. Okay, so we're finally uh, at this picture. On the bottom left, we have virtual hardware again, which is similar to here. Uh, and then we have the, a real operating system. So we didn't virtualize the operating system. We have a real operating system as a library, and that's what unikernels are. And they it basically implement a single process virtual machine. And if you look at where we started this lecture, we had a single process real machine there. And so we've come really full circle from 30 years ago. We're all the way back to a single process machine. And so this is ironic that it took us 40 years to get back to basically where we started with running systems with just the little added virtual hardware piece at the bottom. Okay. So that is basically operating systems. And how much time do I have? Is that accurate? Okay, so I'll take a uh, I'll take a five minute break and then we'll go through Docker uh, and how to use it. Okay, so we're uh, we're gonna cover Docker.
Um, and then I'm going to go through the labs, which is a bunch of Docker uh, exercises for you to get uh, used to uh, using the tool. Okay, so Docker uh, is well known for making containers easy. Uh, so containers had been used internally at Google, at uh, Heroku was another place that used containers in the early 2000s, but this was sort of back-end magic. Uh, and it wasn't until Docker had a way of making it so that the UI was something that normal people could use, <laughs> I should say. So uh, it is now the de facto standard for packaging application and operating system environments into a single package. Uh, and so uh, it leverages the underlying operating system support. So it built on top of this Linux container support in the kernel. So that preceded Docker. The Docker engine and the Docker runtime was just built on top of that, and it made, the, made life for developers really easy. And this is why the thing took off. Um, uh, so some terminologies before we begin. Uh, the first thing is a container image. This is a static file. And it contains the libraries and the dependencies that your container is going to need. And this you can think of as a program binary, like bin ls. Okay? Uh, then when you want to run an instance of a container image, you instantiate a container. And this is your live running uh, container instance. Uh, and this is like running a process. So you do bin ls. Bin ls is the binary. That's the image. When you type ls, it creates a process, an instance of ls, and that would be the similar thing as your container. OK. Um, so container images can be stored either locally. So in this case, um, this signifies that it's stored on disk. Or the image can be stored over the network. And you can give it a URL, effectively a URL saying, I want to instantiate that image. And it's almost like a network file system. Um, going and getting your image over. And then what happens is, given these images, the kernel and Docker will instantiate different running containers based on the images that you have asked it to run. Okay, so that's the model. So uh, in terms of the system, the Docker engine is the thing that's running on your container-enabled operating system that is managing the individual containers and the container images that you want to use. Um, and it's got a combination of like Git kind of things and a combination of operating Linux operating system commands uh, done in a way that actually makes sense. Uh, so the first thing that it allows you to do is to operate on the images themselves. So there's this idea of pushing and pulling container images just like you would find in Git to get those images either to or from your system elsewhere. It also has the idea of instantiating containers, creating, destroying, starting, stopping, and attaching and detaching from a container. And these are more similar to what your Linux commands are for you know, listing binaries and doing a PS and doing these sorts of operations. OK. Uh, the other part of the Docker system is the registry service. And this is a GitHub-like repository for container images themselves. Uh, and it's cloud-based storage and distribution for your images. So when I gave you that picture where you're unifying the dev and the uh, production, what they'll do is they'll have a container registry, and uh, the dev team will upload the newest version of their container to the registry, and then the, the operations team will just pull it and then run it. So that, that's what a container registry is. Uh, the registry can either be public or private. In your lab, you are going to use uh, the public Docker Hub uh, repository. Within your Google Cloud project, uh, you can set up your own private repository because you don't want your company's jewels on Docker Hub. So they, uh, but you want to be able to run Docker commands to you know, run your operation. And so uh, the, the Google Cloud Container Registry, you can see in the hamburger dropdown, you can scroll down there and you can see that you can upload and download image uh, container images to that service and it's, sta it's stored internally to your Google Cloud project. And this is gcr.io is the, is the URL for that registry. OK, so how do you specify a container? Uh, well, the, the container image is specified via this thing called the Docker file. 
and it's similar to a make file. It's a recipe that when you run will create the image that you need to run everywhere. Uh, so this is almost like an install file uh, is what a Docker file is. So the first thing in a Docker file is, well, what is your base, right? So uh, when you specify a base, if everyone is using the same base, you only need one copy of that base stored locally. Docker only needs to store one Ubuntu 16.04 base. And if everyone is using that, that's the only base it has on its system. Uh, the other thing that you would want to do is specify perhaps the maintainer of the image. Uh, so for your homework, I want you to make sure you, fill, you change that to your name and your email address. Uh, and then this is the recipe for building a container image. So you want your operating system, your virtual operating system, to have certain programs on it. You want to establish your environment. That's what a Docker file does. So the thing that it does is it does an apt update, and then it installs Python pip. Because I'm running a Python Flask server, I need that uh, on my operating system. So this is part of the libraries that I install. And so these are the verbs and the commands that you give the Docker uh, build command. And then it will run these things to start building your image. And then maybe your source code is located in the same directory as your Docker file, and you want to copy your entire current directory into this path on the Docker container, or on the Docker container image, I should say. So I want to copy all my files into slash app on the container image, and then I want to set the working directory to that, that directory, so that when someone runs a command, it will be running in slash app. Uh, and then finally, I will pip install all of my Python packages that I uh, require, so like Flask in the case of your, uh, so homework number three is to dockerize your uh, homework number two. So uh, in, in requirements, you're going to basically specify, I need Flask. At a minimum, you'll need Flask in your requirements. Uh, and then you can say, what's the command, the entry point and the command that I want to run once I instantiate this image? So when I create the actual container instance from the container image, it's going to run Python on the program app.py in that working directory. And that's how, when you say docker start this container, that's what it'll do. It'll run that command. Okay? Are there any questions about what's in this docker file? It's basically like an install script for your virtual operating system is what you can view it as. Okay, so the way you take that Docker file and create the image is with a Docker build command. Uh, and this is similar to make for C. Uh, Docker build will basically compile, based from your Docker file, it'll compile the new image um, uh, based on the recipe and Docker file. You can, uh, as part of the build, you have to specify a name for your image. How are you going to reference that image? And that's done with a tag. Uh, you could either do the dash T in docker build, or you could do a docker build, and then you can tag it after. Um, so this is an example, docker build. Uh, I want to create a tag for this uh, container image uh, called flask hello world, and then uh, I want you to build from the current directory, and that current directory should have a docker file in it by default. So that will build your container image, and it will name it flask hello world. Uh, and you can also tag it using a, a registry name. So in this case, uh, this is my user ID on Docker Hub. And so this is why we had you create a Docker Hub account initially to get this ID so that we could then do a pull from your, uh, from your Docker images that you upload. So this says, you know, I want this thing to be tagged as this remote registry path. Uh, and then, uh, and then create the image from, uh, with that tag. Uh, if I build this, it's sitting here locally named this, but I want to eventually push that up to Docker Hub. And in order to do that, I have to log in with my Docker Hub credentials. And that's what Docker login does. It logs you into your Docker Hub account. Uh, so you do Docker login. It gives what's your username, what's your password, authenticates the Docker uh, session locally. And then you can do something, um, so if you didn't do this, then you could also say docker tag this local name with this docker hub name is, is that command. So I could have specified this, docker build this local name, and then if I want to associate this local name with that registry name, then I would just tag the two together. Uh, and then what I can do is I can do a docker push. And what this will do is it'll take my version 
uh, of my local version of this container image and then push it up to Docker Hub. And this allows someone on a different machine to do a Docker pull of this basically URI and then get my container image. And this is what we'll be doing to grade homework number three. Uh, based on the ID that you've given us, we'll just Docker pull your ID slash the container name for homework three, and then we'll be able to run it uh, and, and, and run, run tests against it. Okay, uh, if you want to pull a, a, an image from Docker Hub, that, that's the command, Docker pull uh, with a path uh, associated with it. And by default, if you do Docker pull in this path, it will always look for at Docker Hub. If you want the thing to go to like GCR rather than Docker Hub, then you can specify gcr.io slash name slash container image. Uh, but for everything in this class, just, you, you can just use the default. We're just gonna put everything up in Docker Hub. I don't wanna confuse you too much. Um, and then uh, if you want to, so you're building containers and it's storing it in the Docker engine. It's like part of the file system for your container images. If you wanna see what's in there, you would just type Docker images and you'll get a list of all the images and how much space they're taking up on your disk. Uh, so that's helpful, because if you keep on building images and not deleting them, you'll run out of file system space, and then you'll wanna, <laughs> that happened to me. I had gigs and gigs of container images. I'm like, gosh, where's all this stuff being stored? And it's stored in var, run, Docker image. It's stored in some crazy place that I didn't expect it, and I'm like, oh wow, that's, that's why I'm, I have no disk space. Um, if you want to, if you have too many images stored and you say Docker images and it gives you a list of 100 images and you want to start deleting them, uh, the command is to do a Docker RMI and the name of the container image. Uh, and this is similar uh, to doing, so this command is similar to doing an ls of slash bin. How many binaries are there in my slash bin? This is the equivalent of removing a binary. <laughs> This is like removing slash bin slash command or doing an app get remove. You're actually removing the binary, uh, the binary package uh, with the RMI command. And this is important because these are all image operations. So we have a set of operations that operate on the images. We're gonna have a different set of operations that operate on the running container itself. And so I wanted you to keep these separate because if you get them confused, you're lost. Docker is lost to you. So these are the two separate spaces, the images, and then we're gonna talk next about the actual containers themselves. Uh, so the Docker container command, uh, the first is launching a container given a container image. Uh, and that's done with, you can use multiple commands, but the one that uh, I use is docker run. Um, the docker run can, creates the container based on the image name, and the image name could either be a local container name or you could give it a path. You could say Docker run something from Docker Hub and it will actually automatically download the image and run it. So that's what Docker run does. Uh, there are multiple ways to start up a container. There's one where you can run it interactively with a dash IT flag. And then another one where you just wanna detach the container but allow it to continue to run in the background. Uh, so these are different options. Um, the Docker run is effectively a Docker pull, followed by a Docker create, where it creates the new container instance, followed by a Docker start, where it runs the container all in one. Um, so you could individually do this, or you could just run, uh, you can just do Docker run. So in this command, I say, do a Docker run, uh, detach the container, meaning I don't want an interactive shell on the thing, uh, uh, map, port 8000 to port 8000, and then this is the name of the container I want. So pull something from the registry, and then you run it uh, in detached mode immediately, and then hopefully this will bring up a web server on port 8000 that you can then hit. Okay, uh, to view all of your containers, both active and stopped, you would do a docker ps-a, and this is where it borrows the Linux commands, uh, and in particular, this is like doing a ps, so PS AUXWW says lists all the processes on the Linux operating system, including those from other people. Uh, P, Docker PS-A says list all the container instances, both the ones that are running and the ones that are stopped. So you can have, you can stop and start containers and uh, they're just stored in memory versus, uh, and, th and these are, you're stopping instances of containers running rather than the container image um, from the previous slide. 
Uh, you can stop a running container, uh, and this is similar to stopping a process. So uh, you could send a control Z or a kill dash stop to a process on Linux, and it puts it into a stop state where it's not being scheduled to run anymore. This is what a docker stop command does to a container. It basically stops all the running threads on it uh, and puts it in an idle state, basically a, a sleep state. Um, and you just say docker stop and then the name of the container is the syntax. If you want to restart the container, you can just docker start with the name of the container. And this is similar to sending a stopped process, the continue signal that starts it, ba starts it back up. Uh, you can attach to a running container. And if you have a, a shell on that thing, it would give you the interactive shell or detach from it, um, from that container. So that's the opposite. I, I don't show that here, but you can detach as well. You can execute a command on the running container. Uh, so here, docker exec, the name of the container and the command you want to run on that. Uh, so for example, if I want to run an interactive shell on this container, I can just do a dash it bin bash to get a shell on that container, if my container actually has uh, bin bash. You'll see that some container images, they don't give you bin bash, and that'll be part of your homework um, as you go through there. Um, when you deploy a container and stuff goes wrong, you're going to be like, what, what's going on in that container? Like, uh, how do I get the error messages from it? Docker logs uh, with the name of the container will get you the output. Uh, that that container is emitting. So in your Flask application, if the thing is not doing what you think it's doing, then and it's running as a container, then you might do the Docker logs to figure out what exactly is going on within that container. Um, you can also, oh, so uh, this is actually more of an image operation. If you have, if you get onto a container and you start installing stuff and you're like, wow, I want to save this as the new image, Say you've, you, you've debugged something in some library or, or something and you want to actually save that as the new container image, you can do, you can get outside of the container and you can do a docker commit of the container ID to the image name that you want to now store that as. So this will update the container image name with the, stat, the, the contents of the running container. This is not really recommended. It's, it's very uh, expeditious, but the problem here is that it bloats the image uh, because every single command that you run within the container will add some changes to the image, and it's the conglomeration of all of those commands that get stored into the image. And so you'll see that if you do a Docker commit, your container image is going to be enormous. Um, so this is not something that you, you know, it might be good for developers initially, but when you want to create a runtime production container image, you want to make sure you do everything from scratch and only install the stuff that is absolutely needed. Uh, but I put that command there just in case you want to tweak your, your container image. Uh, so if you, so I mentioned earlier that uh, this, these are like running processes. Containers are running processes. If you have a whole bunch of stopped containers and you want to actually get rid of them, then the command is docker rm. This is different than rmi. rmi is removing the binary. Docker rm is removing the instance. So that's why we have these two separate commands. So docker rm, uh, the name of the container instance is the argument for that. Uh, and you'll get practice for all of this stuff. Um, so it's complicated enough that there's this really interesting Minecraft UI for managing Docker containers that you can watch, then maybe that'll help you with the abstractions. Um, there's one for Kubernetes, which we'll, I'll also point you to, because these, it's hard to wrap your head around these concepts sometimes, and so maybe a cartoon version will help you. Um, this is also a good picture to look at when you're trying to figure out what different commands are doing. You can see up top, these are all the image commands, the push and the pull and the login that gets you to a registry. And then within the, uh, your local system, you're tagging images, you're doing an RMI on these images to delete them. Uh, you, can, you can run docker build to create the images. And then to actually run the image, you'll do the docker run. And within the container space to actually operate on specific instances, you can say, you know, I can get the logs, I can attach, I can exec, stop, start, remove, and do a PS on all those containers. And this is the set of commands that are operating on your instances. Um, OK, and then finally, that commit that I, that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. So does run create an instance or start creating an instance? Uh, run, 
creates the instance and create creates an instance. So there's a Docker run that's both the, um, the pull, the create, and the start. Uh, then the create is also able to create an instance. You do Docker stop and start uh, if you want to, if so for example, you don't want to run this thing anymore. Um, say, say you don't need it, you're logging out and you don't need the thing to be running as you logged out, you would do a Docker stop on this container. And then when you log back in and now you want to run the container again, you could do a Docker start and then, and then get a shell. So this happens, uh, so in the, in the malware class, there's a, there's a container that I have people run, it's a fuzzer. And you don't need to run the container if you're not running the fuzzer, if you're not doing the homework. So you would do a Docker start when you log into the virtual machine and you want to run it, then you could do a Docker start. And then when you're about to log out, you do a Docker stop. And then, and then if you have anything else running on that machine, then it'll be, it frees up resources for something else that's running on that machine is the idea. Any other questions about these commands? Uh, so the best thing to do with these commands is get practice. And this is what the, the, the container lab is about, uh, for you to get some repetitions uh, with, this, with these commands. Okay, uh, in terms of an implementation, so eventually uh, you might get to a point where in your job you're building containers and uh, if you're trying to use this in production, you sort of, it's a good idea to know underneath how the thing is actually implemented. Um, and so for each container image, it consists of a collection of what they call layers. And every container image can hold up to 128 layers. Uh, and the, the reason why they do this in layers is because they only want to store stuff that's different between container images. If you have five container images and all they do is differ by one library, then you want to store one base set of layers and then you store the individual layers that they differ from in other uh, parts of the file. Okay, so Docker, the Docker runtime is only going to store these unique layers, and the layers are implemented, every line of the Docker file adds a layer to your container. So at most, your Docker file can have 128 commands in it. Uh, and so this is the, a picture of it. So if you go to imagelayers.io and you give it uh, your Docker, the path to your Docker image, uh, it will break it down into the individual layers and how much uh, space they take up. So here, the base layer of uh, Ubuntu 14.04 is going to cost you almost 200 megabytes. When you run the command, add this particular file to the container. It must have been a huge file because it's 188, uh, or this, yeah, it's 188 megabytes. This is basically doubling the, the, the container uh, image size. Uh, running echo bin shell, so maybe you have some script that you're adding to it. Uh, et cetera, and there's a set operation. And then the image size is the sum of all of these images. And then when you have another uh, container image over here, if they share layers, then Docker doesn't need to store multiple copies of that. So that's, that's the reason why this is architected as, as layers uh, in this way. So almost everybody is going to do an apt uh, update as their first command after they, the base layer 1804, I'm going to do an apt update. Uh, and the results of that will be the same for everybody. So I only need to store that one layer, and then everybody can, can reuse that layer rather than rebuilding and, and, and making replicas. Uh, okay, that's pretty much all I want to get into in terms of the details of the implementation. Um, as part of your homework, uh, you are going to try and make your container as small as possible. Uh, so there are strategies for making this as small as possible. The first thing is to use a tiny base layer. So you can seek out uh, Alpine, Ubuntu Minimal, or BusyBox uh, to get rid of all the parts of the operating system you don't need. Uh, and the other thing is to have these enormous Docker commands, like one monolithic command to do all the installation, because in the end, the layer that gets stored, you're doing it per layer, if you have one command that does all the installation and removes all the intermediate files, the output of that will be one layer. If you did those individually, every command stores the delta of your changes. And so uh, when you apt install followed by apt remove and you store that as one image, it actually has the app install state in your image still because it's, do it's doing the incremental changes in the image layers. Uh, and so what you'll see is something like this. 
So rather than do an apt get update, which is what I do, so I think in the default Docker file, it, I do an apt update, and then I do a run apt get install, and then I do something else. This, where you're running everything all in one command, actually saves you space in your image. Because all of this cleanup is being done within the same layer, within the same command. And it's the output of this that will get you uh, the final state. So you could actually, so this is, this is the pattern that you would like to have, and then the final layer is a command. Um, so as you're shrinking your container layers, look for shortcuts like this. Uh, um, the other thing you can do is you can find different ways of installing your packages. So this, this low-level package manager can allow you to um, get rid of the cache. So one of the things that app does is it creates an, a package cache locally. Uh, and that thing takes up space even though you're not installing anything after this initial container image thing. So you don't actually want the cache to be automatically uh, uh, used. And so you can send the no cache flag. You know, just download the thing once and don't store it. <laughs> don't store what I've installed because no one else is going to pip install or, or apt install after I'm done. So you can do the same thing for pip. You can do the same thing for APK. Uh, any of the temporary files that either of these two tools will create, just delete them. And that will also, because you don't need these things as well, um, the output of that. Um, you can also seek out compression tools. Docker Squash is one of them. And this is really important. Like if you have a tiny image, you can bring that thing up very quickly. Those images can come up and down within the matter of, of, of you know, in seconds count uh, for a user. Like you have to be able to, 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 be able to bring up and down uh, images uh, quickly. Okay, so with that, I want to, do I have time? How much time I have? five minutes. I want to run through uh, quickly what you're going to be doing for the four container labs. <coughs> um, I have it here somewhere. This is a sun, this is due Sunday. Yeah, the container stuff. So on a Ubuntu 18 VM, uh, you're going to clone the repository and then go into this container guestbook. Uh, and then you're just going to take a look at this and change, change the maintainer name to yourself. And you can see I've done the, the, I've done the thing that cost me a lot of space here. I've done these things separately. Uh, and so uh, you're, this is the only thing you're going to do is just change the maintainer name. Uh, and then uh, you're going to add yourself to the Docker group. Uh, on your VM, uh, and then log out and log back in. And this just allows you to run the Docker commands without having to sudo everything, uh, is this command. Uh, and then you just run this command to build. From this Docker file, you're going to just build an image called Hello Ubuntu. You're going to show that when you do a Docker images that it creates this local image file. You're going to run it on port 8000, it actually comes up on port 5000, but then you can remap port 8000 to connect up to the container port 5000. You're gonna name your container, hello you, and then you're gonna, uh, you're gonna run it in a detached mode, and then you're gonna say, this is the container name that I want you to, the container image I want you to run. And then you're gonna curl, just to show that you've, you've gotten the container up and you've pulled the page. So this is the guest book uh, that you're gonna be running. You're going to do a Docker PS A to, to see the container called Hello Ubuntu in your, or Hello U on your listing. Um, you're going to stop it. You're going to do a PS A to see that it's stopped. Uh, you're going to restart it. And then you're going to execute bin bash on it. And then you're going to do an ls and a ps on the, uh, in the container to show that it's running. Uh, and then you're going to exit out of the container. Uh, you're going to do a login. You're going to do a tag. And then you're going to push this up to your repository just to give you some uh, practice with this. And this is a setup for, for homework number three. Uh, you're gonna stop the container that you have instantiated and remove it. Uh, moreover, you're gonna remove the local image. So remove Hello Ubuntu, remove your local version of the Docker Hub image. So after you've done a push, make sure that that image shows up in Docker Hub, because I want you to delete all of the local images. <laughs> And then I just want you to run that docker run command again, and you'll see the thing automatically download from Docker Hub, uh, your container. And then you view this again, and then show it on Docker Hub and this metadata site uh, micro badger. 
Uh, container lab number two is to do the same thing using Hello, uh, using Alpine. So this is uh, this is the the version of a smaller, a lighter version of of Ubuntu. Uh, of uh, Linux that you can run as a base image. So exact same things. You'll see that the thing breaks uh, on one of this one of these pathways, and so uh, answer the questions uh, that 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 are asked of you, and just repeat the exact same thing. Uh, container lab number three. Now that you have a container built, I just want you to create a VM on Google Cloud, install Docker on it, uh, run it. Uh, map port 80 to 5000, uh, and then create a um, uh, create a running instance of this container. Uh, you'll need to enable the port. Uh, you need to enable this as a web port, and then just show that you can get to your container on Compute Engine. And then the last one is to use this container operating system to instantiate another version of this on uh, Compute Engine. And this is a different kind of operating system. It directly runs your container basically on bare metal. Like there isn't a Docker runtime per se. And what it does is it runs your container and it gives you full access to the ports. So there is no mapping of ports. When you run that container, it comes up on port 5000. And then these will take you just a couple of minutes to run. It's just a matter of creating the, the VM, pointing it to your container image, and then and then testing that it, that it actually comes up. And this is just to give you just some experience working with these things in the cloud. All right. And then with that, uh, you just have to follow the, follow the directions. OK, so that's where I'll stop.